here. Welcome to week eight of Capitol Beat. I'm Joshua Gorman with the Vermont Press Bureau. And joining me now is Secretary of State Jim Condos. And we are going to discuss the possible creation of an ethics commission. Uh, we know that this is something that you were in favor of. So if you would tell us what is an ethics commission and why do you think this would be good for the state? Well, first, first let me start off by saying, Josh, thank you for having me. Uh, but I also want to say that the vast majority of our uh, local, state, and municipal officials are trustworthy, are dedicated, are trying to do the right thing for their communities. Uh, but when you can have little, it's kind of like the death of a, by a thousand cuts. Uh, the, the whole idea is that we need to prevent uh, any even ripples of, of, of corruption uh, entering into our governments. Uh, what, what we've seen in our office uh, receives calls almost every day of the week from municipals, from uh, municipal officials, from uh, from constituents of those officials. Uh, we receive calls from state officials about potential problems, and and we research it and try to give them an answer as to whether you know the right processes or or whatever to follow um, what the law says, um, and. What we've seen is an increase in the number of, co of complaints that are coming to us from, from citizens. And my feeling when I started looking into this was that the, it, we're one of three or four states in the country that does not have an ethics commission, an independent ethics commission to receive those complaints, investigate them, and determine if there's any validity, and then make recommendations or enforce uh, the law. And uh, if you just look at the Northeast, we're the only state in the Northeast, and that includes Pennsylvania and New Jersey and New York. Uh, we're the only state in the Northeast that does not have an ethics commission. The usual statement is that, hey, this is a small state, we know everybody, mm -hmm. therefore we don't need it. But it's the little things that happen that, that really create the problems. We've seen an increased number of, of embezzlements. I'm sure you've covered some of them. Of uh, we've had open meeting law violations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Conflict of interest is a huge issue, and I think that what really starts to happen is that we do not have a mandatory conflict of interest policy. What we have is enabling legislation that allows municipalities and state government to they have the authority to set one, but they don't have a mandate to set one. So at the very minimum, I'm suggesting that that's what we need to do is at least mandate that every state agency, every appointed officer, every a uh, uh, municipal officer has a conflict of interest policy and a code of conduct that they follow. Um, that will probably reduce 90% of what we have out there. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a case re recently that uh, a, a state in, in, in south of here, I mean, a, state, a, a, a town south of here, where the select board uh, paid itself in, in, through contracts some f a half a million dollars uh, for uh, projects that they were doing in the town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's really like, really? Uh, right. You know, how do you, how do you get, go about that? Mm -hmm. so. so what current recourse does a rank and file resident of Vermont have right now if they believe that there is a conflict of interest? What can, what can they do about it right now? The great question, because in, in general, first, the first question we always ask is, does your town have a conflict of interest policy? Mm -hmm. Because it is enabling, there's no mandate that they have it. So that's the first question. And then we say refer to that, con that conflict of interest policy to determine what the conflicts are that they cover and, and what the procedures are for uh, uh, addressing them. The other thing is to bring them up, bring them, to the, bring them to the, out in the public. Go to the select board meetings and, and ask the questions, the important questions that need to be asked at the select board meetings or even at town meeting. Mm -hmm. Since town meeting's in another two weeks, uh, it's probably a good, good thing to do uh, is to ask at town meeting, what are, what are you doing about this? Or, or even to have citizens ask their town to adopt a conflict of interest policy. So I think, I think there's a lot that can be done um, that really doesn't cost a whole lot. Uh, and, and I know there's a lot of concern in the building about um, the cost of setting up an ethics commission with staff and whatever. My only response to that is, what's the cost of having good government? What's the cost of having a good democracy? And, and I think it's a pretty minimal when you look at it in, that, in those terms. Okay. 
statutorily, what sort of authority would an ethics commission have in terms of e either uh, levying any sort of binding decisions or, what, I mean, what sort of authority would they, would they have, you think? Well, there's, there's probably 47 models around the state and right. they're probably around the country and they're right. all different. Sure. Um, I know that in, in um, Massachusetts, they have uh, an executive director, 22 to 24 members of the staff, uh, and a five-member uh, board that meets on a per diem basis. Mm -hmm. um, they, they receive and investigate 900 to 1,200 complaints a year in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't expect that we would have anything close to that. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact of the matter is you do have to, you have, if you're going to have an independent, it's got to be independent um, of any state agency, of any elected office. Uh, I think it has to be um, it has to have a staff that has some authority to uh, acquire the information that's necessary to investigate uh, complaints. And then the, the, the board has to be given the authority to, to dole out punishment, if you want to call it. Uh, I, th I do think that the, the real role of this group should be education first. Mm -hmm. Hammer second. Right. Um, I don't think the hammer should be the one that we're holding over people's heads. Sure. I think it, it, we ought to be looking at how we educate people. Yeah. I mean, do you think it's as much a matter of uh, there's actually impropriety going on, or do you think it's about the appearance uh, and, 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 in, and people's inability to be able to determine whether or not something is going on? In, in many cases, it is the appearance. And, and actually, if you look at most conflict of interest policies, it will say whether you have a direct or indirect or an appearance of a conflict, mm -hmm. and and that's the piece you've got to address. And and it's hard sometimes to write clear language, but um, we, you know I think we've got pr some pretty smart people in the building. We can probably do it. Now Vermont is a really tiny state compared with others, and I mean everybody seems to at least here it seems like everybody knows somebody or is in a relationship with somebody or, or is employed in some way. Do you think a conflict of interest policy is going to be challenging for a tiny state like Vermont? Um, it. Maybe, but that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anything else you would want folks to know from your perspective on this, sir? No, I just think that, that you know, if you're going to, if you want to have good government, and you, to do that, you have to have open and transparent government. You have to be accountable and, and, uh, and transparent. You know, I do the Vermont Transparency Tour every other year. Mm -hmm. We do 12 to 15 stops on that throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And it's really about educating the public on the open meeting law, on the access to public records law. And that's, that's what we're trying to do is just educate Vermonters. Excellent. Uh, switching gears for a second, you, you said that, yeah, we got town meeting coming up in like uh, two weeks. What's, what's that like uh, for, for your office right now? Um, well, we will be open. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be, someone will be on staff probably from about 5.30 or 6 in the morning until probably 10 or 11 at night. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have folks in the building and uh, we will be receiving calls from town clerks and, and uh, select boards uh, on procedural issues, questions, uh, um, and you know, as they, as they vote and uh, if there are any problems with the election process. Uh, so we, we're available and ready to go. If, if we'll have um, vendors, uh, members of our vending team that, that the machines come from, the tabulating machines are available to us. So if there is a problem that we can send someone quickly, uh, to get that uh, problem resolved. So it, it's, a, it's a busy day for us, uh, uh, and leading up to it, it gets busier every day. Sure. So. Um, so, do you, so do you find yourself fielding calls on the fly, especially from towns that do that still have the, the uh, traditional floor meeting we, to, we are, to be able to determine, hey, is this uh, okay? That was sometimes we do. do. Sometimes yeah. we do. I mean, they have our cell phones, and, and they know that they, that they can call us and know you know, we'll have uh, probably five to six people in the building uh, working to answer the calls and, and uh, try to respond as quickly as we can. Excellent. Very nice. Secretary Connors, thank you so much for coming You're welcome. by. I really appreciate it. And we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. Uh, this week, lawmakers approved a bill that's going to allow for paid sick leave for all workers here in Vermont. Uh, joining me to talk about this is Lindsay Delorier. She is the director of Main Street Alliance of Vermont. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Sure, thank uh, you. So tell us, what's going on with this? What's your interest in this? And uh, yeah, what's going on? Well, I personally have been working on this issue for several years, maybe about five years. Mm -hmm. Most recently, um, I've been representing Main Street Alliance of Vermont. We are a nonprofit organization that works with small business owners around the state on public policy issues, and we have 
uh, taken a supportive issue, a supportive position on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, we've worked with a coalition of over 250 business owners in the state to look at the policy that was introduced originally, make recommendations for how to find the right balance for mm -hmm. the issue to work for business owners and for workers. And the business owners I've been working with have done a great job of helping the legislature to sort of track that course and find a solution that obviously um, was the right solution for Vermont. Excellent, and so can you just break down for us uh, how is this exactly going, going to work? When, when's this going to kick in and uh, how's, it going to, how's it going to affect employers and employees? So the legislation is set to go into effect on January 1st of 2017. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, employees around the state will be able to begin accruing paid time off according to the legislation. Of course, for employers who already provide paid time off policies of any kind, so whether it's vacation, combined time, or sick leave, they, they won't really see an impact. Mm -hmm. They likely won't see any impact at all as long as employees can use their paid time for sick days. Mm -hmm. um, for employers who aren't currently providing sick leave, on January 1st their employees will begin to accrue, but there's a one-year waiting period for new employees and a one-year waiting period for all employees at the start of the legislation. I see. Very good. Now, you said you work with uh, small businesses, you had a coalition of about 250 of them. We heard some op opposition on behalf of small businesses saying that they this is going, going to hurt them, and in fact there was um, a, there was a it was an effort to exempt businesses of what five five employees or fewer correct absolutely the business community there has been division in the business community on this issue mm -hmm. the business owners that we worked with were those who in principle supported the idea that there should be a minimum standard of paid time for all workers in Vermont and then their objective was to figure out how to make that standard work for business owners mm -hmm. there are um, also business owners who feel that any new mandates on businesses, uh, or perhaps this particular mandate isn't the right thing for Vermont at the time. Uh, so there is division there, um, but the businesses that we work with supported it. Excellent, wonderful. Do you have any indication how many businesses who supported it already offered this? By any chance? I mean, I mean, there's, there certainly are. There must be a number of small businesses that currently already offer uh, paid, paid sick leave, right? Absolutely. Yeah. About half of the businesses in Vermont currently offer paid sick leave. That's according to a Department of Labor survey. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the businesses on our coalition who we worked with, the majority of them did do provide sick leave, although there are a number of them, particularly in food service, interestingly, mm -hmm. who are on our coalition, who supported this legislation, but don't currently offer it themselves. And the reason that I've heard cited for that is they want the level playing field. They want everyone to offer it when they offer it. Mm -hmm. Food service, the food service industry, um, is an industry that is probably the least likely right now to provide paid time off. So this is an industry where you're going to see a lot of impact mm -hmm. from this legislation. And so for many of the owners who were on our coalition who didn't currently offer it, they felt that they were excited to have a standard where everyone was going to be doing it. It was really going to provide culture change and everyone would be doing it at the same time so there would be you know, equality in terms of a competitive advantage. Yeah, and it's a bit ironic, isn't it, that uh, food service people are most likely to not have this time off because really your food handler is probably the one person you want to make sure is healthy, correct? I think that's very ironic in terms mm -hmm. of the public perspective, but I will say that one of the real drivers behind this legislation is precisely that, is the public health impacts of that. And so food service handlers but not just that, uh, people working in retail, coming into contact with the public, um, care providers, whether it's child care or elder care, these are all areas where uh, there are a sig there's a significant portion of the workforce that don't currently have paid leave, and obviously those are the sectors where you'd hope most to have people with paid leave because they're in contact with the public or with vulnerable populations. Very good. So you, you've achieved your, your goal here of paid, paid sick leave. What's next for uh, Main Street Alliance? Well, we have a lot of things in the works. This year in the legislature, we're supporting the effort uh, for, to ask the legislature to pass us financing for the uh, Dr. Dinosaur expansion proposal. So mm -hmm. the Dr. Dinosaur 2.0 campaign mm -hmm. launched last fall. Mm -hmm. We're one of the organizations who are uh, supporting that effort and we hope the legislature will finance a study to expand Dr. Dinosaur up through age 26. Mm -hmm. Very good, excellent. Lindsay, thank you so much yeah. for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Great. It's been great. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. And uh, thank you for uh, watching this week of uh, Capital Beat.